Can you think of two numbers whose sum is four and whose difference is two? Three and one. Three and four. Uh, three and one, you said? I don't even know why I was about to say three and four. Do you have to, like, solve that or something? No. So it's just like, no. Three plus one is equal to four. Three minus one is equal to two. So folks, uh, one of my expectations would be that if I'm working on a particular page in a packet that you at least have your packet open to that page. Almost there. There it is. All right, so given that y is greater than x, write two linear equations using x and y to express this situation from above. All right. So that, that the first one's a little easier, the second one is a little bit kookier. All right, so given that y is greater than x, all right, so the bigger number is obviously the, the y value. Write two linear equations using x and y to express the situation from above. All right, so what do we think? Well, we're going with two linear equations. That, that's where we're talking about doing it in general terms. So before the question was, do we just guess? Do we just use three and one? Do we just say it? Or do we have to use variables, let statements, things like that? So it's kind of phrased differently, but this is a let statement situation. So let y equal the larger number and x equal the smaller. So I need two numbers whose sum is four. So what would I write? Okay, so what would my expression be if I want the sum to be equal to four? Well, it's gotta be an equation, linear equations, y means equal signs, y plus x equals four. And the other one would be what? Exactly. Yeah, it's just one of those situations where it's like, well, it's basically what we were doing in the last unit, two units ago even. Just the, the question was phrased in such a weird way that it's like, wait, what, what are we really looking for? And then maybe you have inequalities on your mind, so that uh, I heard greater than, so that and it is written right there, so then you guys, you have that little bit of an issue. So the question might be, can I come up with a solution like we came up with number one, in number one, using this idea. What would be the benefit of using variables to come up with our solution? What do you think? What did we have to do in order to come up with these solutions in that first example? Yeah, I gotta plug it in, but in order to plug it in, what do we have to do? Did you use a reasoned approach? Or did you just take a guess? Take a shot in the dark? Stare at your teacher blankly? That's fun. That's always fun when that happens. I love when that happens. Shall I answer the question for you? You just you took a shot in the dark. You're like, you, you, maybe it was an educated guess. You thought maybe, oh, OK, this could possibly work. Gave it a shot. It worked. You got lucky. All right? But then what happens if the answer is 22 over 7 plus 14 over 3? I, you're probably not getting that using a guess and check approach, right? So an algebraic approach ends up being the best way to go. All right, so using something like a system of equations, whenever you have more than one equation with more than one variable, it's called a system. For some reason, it's called a system. I have no idea why. But that's what it's called. And as long as you have a number of equations that are consistent with the number of variables, then you could always come up with the solutions for each variable, right? So what we're dealing with here, 
are two equations with two variables. All right, we will be able to get a solution. Now, that is kind of a, a weird thing to say because when I say that we will be able to solve, part of solving a process, uh, uh, an equation or a system or anything is the idea that maybe there is no solution. So in the act of solving, we could determine that, well, maybe there's no answer that satisfies this whole thing. But what this idea is telling me is that it's worth going down this road. If I had two equations with only one variable, it's not even worth trying to do algebra. I'll never get a solution, All right? So my possibilities could be threefold, really. You can end up with no solution, and I'll show you what that means in a little bit. You can get exactly one solution. Or you could have infinitely many solutions. So you got to think about what that means in context. If I were to graph these two equations, each one, one at a time, what would each equation give me visually? I put it in my calculator, I graph it on paper. I'm gonna get a line for each one of them, right? So there's really three ways that these lines can interact. Maybe they don't cross at all. So no intersection. One solution would be where they cross exactly one time, one intersection. The last one is a little tricky because infinitely many, it's like, well, if they're not crossing at all, that's one possibility. They cross exactly once, there's another possibility. The other instance would be that they intersect more than once, all right? More than one intersection. But if you try to visualize that, you try to visualize how two lines might intersect more than once. The only way that that would happen is if that one, if one was physically on top of the other. So they'd have to be the same line, exactly. So those are the three things that we're gonna keep our eyes open for. Now, there's other types of equations out there, curved equations that where you could have more than one intersection without them being one overlaying the other. But for lines, this, these are the only three ways in which you could play out. All right, so our job here, at least for today, is to try to determine solutions to linear systems using a graphical approach, All right? Getting a good sense of how things look graphically is so important moving forward and it's very underrated because it's like it, what, what typically ends up happening is it, you have a graphing calculator so it's like oh I don't know what it looks like so let me just put it in a calculator and if you don't actually consider what it looks like without trying to use a calculator then it, you never truly get a, a, a good sense and, and so just flash forward to algebra 2 pre-calc if you're struggling in those classes it's because of that all right so it's not because the class got harder. It's because you didn't create the appropriate foundations to be successful, All right? That happens here. And, and so what happens uh, more often than not is people get good grades in this course because a lot, of the, a lot of the material is procedural. You just follow the steps, you get the answer. But the folks who are able to actually consider why they're doing what they're doing, you know, like what I was talking about yesterday with the activities, they're able to kind of transcend that. So they, they get good grades while also having good understanding of the content. So those people will do really well in Algebra 2. The ones who just follow the steps and circle their answer, the Algebra 2 is, is a, a very, very, very much a struggle. 
right? So I, I'm trying to get to you early. So, and if you buy in, I, I promise you that by the time you see me in calculus, you're gonna be like in the upper echelon rather than I, I can barely keep my head above water, right? I promise, I mean, it is, it is an oath. All right, so using the two linear equations you created from question two, graph each equation on the coordinate plane provided, and then we want to find the solution. All right, so let's take a look, see. I have one equation, y plus x equals four. We can, we can actually graph that if we wanted to, but the better way to come up with the graph of that would be to get y alone and put our answer in slope intercept form all right so i want to identify the slope which is what negative one and the y intercept which is four so i'm going to graph that so negative one is my slope of a y-intercept we plot first. So four for the y-intercept and then a negative one. I'm gonna zoom in on that as my slope. So rise over run is one. Actually, let me clean this up a little bit. It looks terrible. Get a thicker pen here. Oop, that's a ruler. All right, so down one over one, down one over one, and so on. You only really need one point in addition to your y-intercept, but I find that getting a few of them at least gets you the, you know, the right shape, especially if you don't have a ruler. So if you don't have a ruler, just keep plotting points. All right. If you do have a ruler, then you just really need two points and that ruler. But I find that people are more comfortable doing it freehand. Not because they have drawing ability, but because they just don't want to get the ruler out. So if that's the case, then, then make sure you, you get enough points in there. So why, and so we're gonna, we're gonna put two equations on the same graph, so we need to label them so that we can keep them organized. There's a lot of stuff you did last year. So y equals negative x plus four. Now y equals x, um, well, I don't wanna give it away. So the next one is y minus x equals two. Add x to both sides. And you get y equals x plus two. Slope, one, y-intercept, two. So I'm gonna plot my y-intercept of two, two units above the x-axis, and the slope of one, rise over run of one, up one over one, up one over one, and so on. And then follow the trend in the opposite direction. But there, there is that component. You know, like we start off with what's familiar, so that you have a little bit of a footing, and then we build off of that. That's why this is page five, 
rather than being page like 30 in the packet. So obviously it's gonna get more challenging. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, so, question. Where do these two lines intersect? One, three. One comma three. All right, so where is the solution represented on your graph? It is at the intersection. Specifically, one, three. All right, now I just want to talk about coordinates for a second because it doesn't really matter what class I teach, the conversation involving coordinates comes up all the time. And it's because of lack of understanding on this level that people just end up not really having a good understanding in it. And, and there is a, an issue that comes down the line. So let us take a second and discuss what a coordinate is. So I have some coordinate x comma y. All right. What is the x? I mean, I'm, having the, I'm asking the question, so I'm expecting that maybe you don't know, but I'll give you the opportunity. What is the X? Is it a distance of some kind? Say it again. Or not. Distance across from the X axis. Okay, we could take that. And so typically that's what ends up being the case where people, when you plot points, one comma three, for example, you go across the X axis and then go up into space to figure out where the Y belongs. But really, and this, this is so very important, your distance is really a distance from the Y axis anywhere. All right, so this distance is X. This distance is y. So the x value is the distance a point is from the y axis. And the y would then be the distance from the x axis. from the x-axis. All right, it's just more convenient to count along one of the axes in order to get there. Because, you know, to say, I need to get to this location, how, how can I do it? You know, it's like, just start off three units up and then count over, or start over, or start one unit over and then count up. But like in terms of the consistency, when you think of slope, which is rise over run, you start thinking in terms of y coming first as opposed to x, and people get that confused. And oftentimes when people mess up slope, it's because they start working with the x information first rather than the y. But this is actually a pretty important underlying concept. So any point in space is represented as x comma y, but the x represents the distance from the y axis, the y represents the distance from the x axis. All right. The idea of just counting along x and moving up and down, it's, it's a good way of actually just plotting the point, but it doesn't really talk about why you're doing what you're doing. And so we're going to build off of this idea moving forward also. All right, so I, I know it might seem that I'm trying to take things that aren't that complicated and make them more and more complicated, like more complicated than they need to be. I promise you it's not for, it's, it's not for selfish reasons. It's not so that I can make you miserable it's so that you can actually have a firmer grip on this stuff. And hopefully that'll lead to more success down the line. All right. and, and when I talk about success, I'm talking about success where you won't have to work as hard. All right, that, like a less stressful amount of success. Because you haven't, in a lot of cases, haven't experienced that yet. And I don't want to scare you, but talk to a junior, talk to a senior, ask them about math, they'll tell you. Oh, fun fact, and actually it's not a fun fact. It's more like just information. I had no idea that we have peer tutoring here. No idea. 
peer tutoring, like um, other students, like older students that tutor younger students. Uh, National Honor Society students, NHS, they, uh, one of the things that they do is they, they tutor. So apparently, and I only found this out this morning, there is a yellow form in the library. You fill it out with your information and they'll match you up with a tutor if that's something you're interested in and that tutor will work with you one on one. I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, you can get, you could always get help from me after school during my free periods, but there's also that issue of like, well, maybe our free periods don't match up. Maybe you have a sport after school. Maybe you hate my guts. Hopefully that's not the case. I try to be at least reasonable to everyone, but there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't necessarily make it into extra help. But a peer tutor might be a good option for you, right? I'll send that out on Remind later on, and uh, I'll see if I can get a hold of the form and uh, post that up also. But uh, that could be a good option for you. Now, just so you know, I, I, I wanna be clear about this. There is a responsibility component. So if you tell me that you're coming to extra help after school and you don't show up, I'm like, oh, all right, well, I was here anyway. I would have liked it if you came, you could have used the help, but meh, all right, we'll get you some other time. And then I go home, make some meatloaf, I like meatloaf. And then, and then everything's fine. But if you tell a peer tutor that you're going to meet with them, let's say fifth period in the library, and you don't show up, they rearrange their schedule to do that. So you're really kind of letting them down. So uh, I, that's not to discourage you. It's just to take a little, little responsibility. If you want to go that route, just make sure you hold up your end of the bargain. All right, sound fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah.